Manchin agrees to $700 billion deal with Democrats on major tax and climate bill. Blinken meets with family of slain Al Jazeera journalist. Fauci calls for masks and vaccine boosters for BA5 variant. Extreme heat could wipe out decades of gain in fight against child malnutrition. Bilal Al Habashi Museum in Ethiopia. Islamic New Year begins July 29th. From Washington, D.C., this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Hanna Zuberi. Our top story tonight. U.S. Democratic Senator Joe Manchin has signed onto legislation that would pay down the national debt, lower health care costs, and address the climate crisis. Manchin reached a deal with the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. He said the new policy package, the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, includes realistic energy and climate policy. The move comes nearly two weeks after Manchin was poised to kill off flagship climate action legislation. He opposed raising taxes on wealthy Americans and refused to support more funding for climate action. The Manchin-Schumer deal includes about $370 billion in energy and climate spending, $300 billion in deficit reduction, three years of subsidies for Affordable Care Act premiums, prescription drug reform, and significant tax changes. The House January 6th committee hearings in June revealed alarming new details on former President Donald Trump's alleged coup attempt. Corporate trade groups and Fortune 500 companies donated more than $819,000 to Republican members of Congress who voted against certifying the 2020 election results. That's according to a new analysis by the watchdog group Accountable US. The group has been tracking corporate contributions to the Sedition Caucus, a group of 147 Republican lawmakers who voted to overturn the 2020 election. The vote came just hours after the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. Accountable U.S. analysis shows that since then, corporate trade organizations and political action committees of top companies have donated an overall $21.5 million to caucus members. The U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations and other groups have requested a meeting with the Attorney General to discuss Asim Ghafoor, an American civil rights lawyer. Ghafoor has been wrongfully detained in the United Arab Emirates, the group said. He has not been allowed by UAE authorities to see his attorneys or family members for 14 days, said Jennifer Waxton, a Virginia congresswoman. Ghafoor was transiting through Dubai to join his wife and children in Turkey for a family wedding. He was detained while waiting at the gate at Dubai International Airport. Ghafoor is being held by Abu Dhabi's police at a detention facility and has contracted COVID, according to the council. On Tuesday, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with the family of Shireen Abu Akhl. Abu Akhl was a Palestinian-American journalist shot dead in May by Israeli security forces. She was covering an Israeli military raid near the Jenin refugee camp in the occupied West Bank when she was killed. Blinken wrote on Twitter that the U.S. is committed to pursuing accountability for her tragic killing. Abu Akhle's family, who is of Christian descent, had criticized the results of an investigation in which the U.S. avoided holding Israel responsible for her death. While Palestinian officials and Al Jazeera accused Israel of killing the 51-year-old reporter, Tel Aviv has denied any responsibility. Other investigations by the New York Times and the Washington Post found that Israel was responsible for her death. 
a top ally for the Republican Party nominee for Pennsylvania Governor Doug Mastriano said Jews should not be welcome into the American conservative movement unless they convert to Christianity. The Jerusalem Post reported Andrew Torba, founder of the far-right Gab social media website, said he believes American conservatism should only be for Christians. Torba urged conservatives to reject right-wing Jewish figures such as Ben Shapiro and Dave Rubin. He said Jews are free to stay here and won't be forced to convert. He also said they can enjoy the fruits of living in a Christian society under Christian laws and under a Christian culture. Experts are calling for masks and a new booster being developed by drug makers which will include protection against the BA5 variant of COVID-19. This variant is responsible for an 80% surge in cases. The Biden administration's chief medical officer, Dr. Anthony Fauci, said as fall approaches, people should get an immunity boost with a BA5 vaccine. Pharmaceutical companies Pfizer and Moderna have said that they will update their booster shots by October for this new Omicron variant, which has had the most number of mutations, according to COVID-19 specialist and infectious disease physician, Dr. Uzma Sayed. The variant has a daily average of 125,000 cases and more than 80% confirmed BA.5. Extreme heat could wipe out gain in fight against malnutrition. Details of the study after the break. Stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize, and accuse. Walk a mile in my shoes. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Assalamu alaikum everyone, it's your brother Zain Bika from South Africa. One of the first educational programs ever produced for Muslim children was the ever popular Adam's World series. The colorful and comical Muslim puppets stole the heart of a generation. Sound Vision will be releasing brand new episodes of Adam's World with the launch of a Adam's World app. Subscribers will enjoy new Adam's World episodes as they are released as well as all the classic episodes of Adam's World. So visit adamsworldapp.com now to learn more, subscribe and enjoy new adventures of Adam and his friends. And let's keep helping tomorrow's Muslims today. Assalamu alaikum. Adam's World. Believe me, there's a lot to see. Bismillah. Let's explore. To stop this genocide, we need your help. Welcome back. Global policymakers fail to act decisively to address climate emergency that threatens to erase decades of progress in the fight against childhood malnutrition. That's according to a new study by researchers at Cornell University. The research shows that children in low-income countries increasingly suffer from acute and chronic malnutrition. These communities experiencing the effects of extreme heat, which is becoming more prevalent and severe as fossil fuel extraction persists and carbon emissions rise. Sylvia Blom, a Cornell University doctoral graduate, led the study published earlier this month in the Journal of Environmental Economics and Management. Blum and her co-authors 
compared household survey data from 1993 to 2014 in five West African countries. The study examined the effects of extreme heat on more than 32,000 children, three months to three years old. On Monday, Pakistan's ambassador to Turkey said the freedom struggle of 9 million Kashmiris against occupiers is an example of perseverance and unyielding courage. Ambassador Mohammed Cyrus Sajjad Qazi spoke during a panel discussion in the Turkish capital, Ankara. Qazi called the Kashmiri freedom struggle a classic example of unprecedented oppression by the world's second largest state. It also represents unyielding courage, resolved determination, and perseverance by more than 9 million Kashmiris. Ankara-based think tank Institute of Strategic Thinking organized a panel discussion on the legal issues surrounding the Kashmir conflict. The group said Kashmir is one of the longest lasting situations of foreign occupation, similar to Palestine, and the longest unresolved UN Security Council issue. Bilal Al Habashi Museum in the Ethiopian capital Addis Ababa showcases priceless pieces of proud history of Islam in the Horn of Africa nation. Muslims constitute 34% of the country's 120 million population. Museum curator Adam Muhammad said that the museum was created by the Al Bilal Habashi Association and operates on member contributions. Its collection includes ancient parchments photographs of Muslim scholars from different generations, and antiques. Ethiopia's Islamic connection dates back to the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the 7th century AD. The Prophet ordered the followers to, his followers to travel to Ethiopia to take refuge from persecution in a land ruled by a ruler he described as a just king. One of the most prominent companions of the Prophet was Bilal ibn Rabah who was from Ethiopia. On Tuesday, the interim Afghan government urged the U.S. to fulfill its commitments made in the Doha Agreement and unfreeze Afghanistan's assets unconditionally. Acting Afghan Foreign Minister Malvi Amir Khan Muttaqi assured Afghanistan's territory will not be used against anyone. He was speaking at an international conference in Uzbekistan on the security of the region. The Central Asian nation is hosting the two-day conference in Tashkent. Muttaki said that the Islamic Emirates of Afghanistan also expects the U.S. to fulfill its commitments as the first part of the Doha Agreement. He said Afghanistan, after 20 years of war, is still under economic sanctions by the U.S. A Ukrainian government agency set up to combat misinformation is accusing three Indian nationals of promoting Russian propaganda. Among the accused are former chair of the government's National Security Advisory Board and former U.S. Democratic Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. The list was released July 14th by the Center for Countering Disinformation, a subsidiary of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council established by presidential decree. The names of three Indian commentators are also on the list former head of India's NSAB, P.S. Raghavan, who served as India's ambassador to Russia, is one. The other two are veteran journalist Saeed Nakwi, Sam Pitroda, former advisor to Prime Ministers Rajiv Gandhi and Manmohan Singh. The Islamic New Year begins July 29th this year based on the Hijri calendar. The word Hijri is derived from Hijra, meaning migration. The starting point of the Islamic calendar is the migration of Prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Medina in 622 AD. The Islamic calendar is lunar-based and has 354 days in the calendar. Muslims do not generally celebrate the New Year. Coming up next after the break is our in-depth analysis segment, so stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. 
Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. It's time for a people's vaccine. Dad, they took over my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org caregiving. We are justice for all. Headquartered in the heart of downtown Chicago, Justice for All is a global humanitarian initiative dedicated to raising awareness for human rights concerns impacting vulnerable minority groups. Our diverse team of staff and volunteers, led by Imam Malik Mujahid, work tirelessly to help Justice for All achieve their goals. We promote policies that protect religious freedom, address the root causes of mass displacement, and recognize the plight of refugees and forced migrants. Together, we can continue to stand up for justice. Justice for all. Welcome back. The Senate passed the $280 billion industrial policy bill to counter China. To discuss this in detail, let's go to Imam Abdul Malik Mujahid. Over to you, Imam Mujahid. Thank you, Hina. Competition with China is nothing new, but it seems America is finally taking it seriously. A Senate has passed a $280 billion industrial policy bill and let's see if it makes a difference. We have um, a Professor Razanik with us. Welcome to Muslim Network TV. Yeah, nice to be with you. Professor William Lazanik is the president of the Academic Industry Research Network and Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Massachusetts. So do you think this $280 billion will do the job? Well. Uh, first of all, uh, I am supportive of government funding industry or funding infrastructure, funding knowledge. I have no problem with that. Uh, but what I look at and what uh, I, I focus on in terms of the research I do is uh, what business does with the funding that it gets from government. And because it's business that we ultimately are getting that funding, they're aimed at them, they're subsidies for business by and large. And uh, they are the ones that have to put in place the processes to generate the products that can compete globally. Um, so that if business either is not going to do that or if it can do it on its own without this uh, taxpayer money, uh, then I, I don't support it. If it really needs the taxpayer money, if that taxpayer money is going to make a difference and this will enable business to, uh, in, in this case, in the United States to keep compete globally, then I support it. Now, the problem is that uh, the businesses, particularly in the semiconductor industry, but throughout the U.S. economy, that are asking for this money, that are kind of begging for this money, that are claiming that if they don't get this money, they'll go and invest in Asia or, or Europe, are companies that have plenty of money. They're just squandering the money and they're doing it on stock buybacks and that's on top of dividends. And for a long time, I've been a leading critic of the practice of stock buybacks, uh, just using your money to 
buy your shares on the open market to, for the purpose of boosting your stock price and making the rich richer, not all shareholders, those who time the buying and selling of shares. Uh, and uh, this is being done by the companies that are lobbying for, or have been lobbying for the CHIPS Act uh, to uh, really an egregious extent. So I wrote a, a paper last uh, uh, fall, I wrote a number of papers, but one came out last fall, uh, which looked at the uh, nine companies that were leading the lobbying uh, for uh, the CHIPS Act, including companies like uh, Intel, Microsoft, uh, a Apple, Apple, Alphabet, uh, et cetera. And I updated that data recently. And uh, those companies uh, for 2011, 2020, had done just over collectively over a trillion dollars worth of stock buybacks. I don't think they should have done any stock buybacks over that period, uh, but they spent that much money on top of dividends uh, uh, buying back their stock. So what they're asking for in terms of the, uh, the CHIPS Act with its $52 billion in subsidies, uh, they've spent 20 times that amount on, on stock buybacks. And uh, it's not just the money they have spent, but the fact that they've had people running those companies that will give away the money to people who don't matter. Because I think one of the big lies out there, the big economic lie is that the stock market funds companies. It doesn't, people just buy and sell shares. Anybody who buys and sells shares should know that, that the stock market doesn't fund companies. And okay, as savers, if we are fortunate enough to have money for to put into the stock market, we can get dividends, but the companies need to have enough left over to reinvest in the companies, the new products and process, pay their workers higher wages, give them careers, have experienced employees. And this is where buybacks come in because they totally undermine that process. So there's a, it's not just the money that's spent on buybacks, it's the fact that that makes them, even if they have enough money to invest in capital equipment, invest in, in machine, you know, R&D, uh, it makes them uncompetitive. And uh, a company like Intel, uh, as a prime example, of course, the leading fa fa computer fabrication, uh, se se uh, semiconductor fabrication company uh, in the United States and a pioneer in this field, uh, they had uh, spent uh, uh, over 100 billion on buybacks over this period of time. Uh, and in the process, they had fallen behind, not China, but Korea and Taiwan. So it's not China that's competing at the high end with, with, with uh, Intel, it's uh, uh, South Korea, Samsung and Taiwan, TSMC. Now who is the biggest customer of TSMC? Who actually allowed uh, Samsung first to start producing high-end chips? It's Apple. So Apple started after the iPhone, which used the highest end chips and they progressively become more higher end. Uh, they started uh, getting outsourcing their chips to Samsung. That got Samsung in the game at the high end. Uh, and then they switched when Samsung became a competitor in smartphones, they switched uh, to TSMC. They, they started that switch in 2011, completed it in 2015. So TSMC's uh, leadership in this field is in part due to Apple's uh, uh, having Apple as a customer. And one of the things I argue in uh, writing up this, this research, and I drew on a industrial uh, uh, um, reporter who had written on electronics industry in uh, 2010, an article, a guy named Mark Lapidus, who wrote an article uh, aimed at Steve Jobs when he was still alive and CEO of Apple, said Apple should build a fab. Now, Apple itself has spent $508 billion uh, on buybacks, not including what it's gonna report this latest quarter, uh, since October 2012, uh, you could have built many state-of-the-art fabs for $508 billion. Just to put it in perspective, uh, Samsung and TSMC uh, have announced plans to spend $27 billion together building uh, state-of-the-art fabs in Arizona and Texas over the next few years. That's one third of what Apple spent on buybacks in one year into fiscal 2021. So, if an Apple is among this, they're not. They're they're not a semiconductor producer. They're designing semiconductor chips now, but they should be. And if they were, we wouldn't be facing this problem 
of uh, Taiwanese and Korean competition. And by the way, it's not in this case, a Chinese competition. Eventually it will be because the Chinese have been catching up. Uh, but uh, to, to just talk about it as if it's the Chinese in this case is just wrong. It's just uh, factually incorrect. And to blame whoever it is uh, uh, that they got subsidies that we didn't get. First of all, that's nonsense. The, the US industry has always got subsidies. Uh, I could go into that you know, for an hour. Uh, so it's never been the subsidies have not been there for U US industry. Uh, they just want more and they've actually wasted the subsidies they've gotten in the past. So I'm for supporting industry. I'm not uh, for this bill or if they're gonna do it as, as they have, they should say no company can get access to these subsidies unless they stop doing buybacks. And I'll just say one more thing on that. Uh, they've been given the lead in doing that by the CEO of uh, Intel, Pat Gelsinger, who became the CEO in February 2021. He's a production guy, not a financial guy. Uh, he was there in the late 80s when uh, head of, uh, as a young guy, producing, developing uh, Cisco's microprocessors. Uh, when he took the job, and he's on the record of this in several interviews, when he took the job, in February 2021 uh, with uh, uh, a CEO of Intel taking over from a totally financial guy named Robert Swan, who was just doing buybacks all over the place. He said he went to the board and he said, no more buybacks, we're building factories, we're investing uh, in the company. So he's already said that. So why isn't he getting all the other people who are lobbying uh, to the government to, to, do this, to say the same things on their own? They're not. So if they're not gonna say it, we should make that a condition. So Professor, uh, so competition is with friendly countries, South Korea and uh, Taiwan. So why China boogie is being used to get the money out of the taxpayers? China is used, uh, you know, that's 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 the boogeyman, right? Uh, we, we can't, use, I mean, Russia, we can use as a boogeyman for other things and, uh, but, Russia doesn't have uh, any industry. That's uh, China's different. China has a wholly different type of uh, regime uh, where they, uh, the government has for decades now, really going back in the 1980s, not before, invested in infrastructure, invested in the knowledge base, and they have uh, 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 developed a highly innovative con uh, economy, actually, by the government not controlling all the companies that are in China that are competing on global markets. So uh, I've written a, a paper on this, which is coming out with the Institute for New Economic Thinking called China's Development Path, which talks about the a way in which the Chinese government has been very smart in uh, funding infrastructure, following knowledge, like the United States has done historically, uh, and, but has also been very smart in saying that in uh, sectors uh, where uh, you need to have transfer of technology for abroad. You need to attract Chinese back who have gotten experience in the United States. You need to uh, uh, compete and move up global value chains uh, that they will not try to control those companies. They will let those companies grow on their own. And Huawei uh, Technologies was often accused of being owned, owned and controlled by the Chinese government is one of those. It's the most innovative company uh, in the world in communication technology and was taking over the lead in smartphones from both Samsung and Apple before under the, the Trump tariff wars, uh, uh, they, uh, the United States forced TSMC to cut off the chips to, uh, to Huawei, uh, saying that they would deny them uh, access to US uh, semiconductor equipment if they didn't do it. So there is a, this is all geopolitical. <laughs> Uh, and in this case, uh, however, the, the competitors are not China. <laughs> the competitors are, uh, in this case, Taiwan and Korea. And what policymakers should be doing is looking closely how they've been able to compete. Now, sure, they've had lots of government subsidies and, and TSMC is partly owned by the uh, Taiwanese government. But the real secret is that they have an experienced labor force who stays on the job for a long time. And when they get the most sophisticated equipment, which they buy on the market, 
uh, they are able to implement those uh, those those uh, that equi- those processes and get uh, the high yielding uh, 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 chips that are needed uh, for their particular application. And that's actually where a company like Intel has fallen down. It's not that they can't buy the machineries from 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 the. So let me let me ask you. When you're saying that our companies have been get, getting subsidies and the other companies in Taiwan and South Korea and China have a level of freedom, uh, although they are controlled, uh, you know, China being a totalitarian countries. So don't you think the difference between the capitalism and communism and totalitarianism is sort of blurring when it comes to the industrial innovation? Absolutely. Look at when uh, before. Uh, at, first of all, the United States has benefited tremendously from Chinese growth, and uh, as we know, U.S. companies are participating there. They, 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 the the trade with China is very important uh, to the United States. The United States is really uh, starting with, particularly, it started before Trump, but particularly with the Trump. Uh, tariffs and continue to to a large extent under Biden. Or shoot, we're shooting ourselves in the foot, particularly given the fraught uh, nature of international trade coming out of the pandemic. Uh, but uh, but along the way, as U.S. companies uh, were benefiting from being in China, getting access to their markets, uh, uh, getting access to their science and technology, and uh, a huge base of, of, of research and knowledge and, and personnel that's in China, including many who come here and get experience here and many who stay here. As they were doing that, people were talking about China as not as some totalitarian state, which it has certainly a top, very top-down uh, government, but as uh, one of the most dynamic capitalist uh, systems in the world. People were forgetting that it's, a, that it's supposedly a different system. And in many ways, it is different, although uh, on issues of human rights, we really have to look at ourselves as well. But in terms of the structure of the economy, the way they've become successful, they're actually not so different uh, because the United States has done the same thing. So the United States since the 19th century has been the most formidable developmental state in history. We would not have any high tech area uh, that we are competitive with this if the government hadn't invested in the, school, the, the, the higher education system and the infrastructure, et cetera. I could go on and on and on about that. That's, that's there. And then we had, for a long time, uh, businesses who would take advantage of that. They would make money and they reinvest it, keep their workers employed. And that's how the U.S. became not only the world's leading industrial economy post-World War II, but it's how we got a middle class. <laughs> how people got jobs that were secure and companies didn't used to always just lay people off or just outsource here or outsource there with no responsibility to employees. That system has changed and everybody knows it's changed over the last 40 years, except a lot of economists think that the more mobility of labor you have, the better off you are, you're not. But that is creating problems now. Uh, These companies like Intel and and Apple and, and Alphabet and Microsoft, in order to develop the leading technologies uh, or to move into new technologies, they need an experienced, stable labor force. And that's very hard to get in the United States where there's lots of job hopping. Everybody's going to where the stock options or stock awards are the greatest. So so that is actually part of the system that, that's broken down. And it, it's really the way in which stock market, more generally, not just stock buybacks, has come to dominate our economy. And, uh, and we've let it dominate the economy. And it's not just right-wingers, it, it's progressives who just think that all oh, the stock market is out there funding companies, we gotta let them do whatever they want to do and are not critical of the types of things that I'm critical of. But uh, my point of view, it's not just leading to a lack of international competitiveness, it's a major cause or the major cause of growing extreme inequality in the United States. And of course, all the political ramifications of that extreme inequality. So this this is the heart of what's wrong with our system and we for, should figure that out. And then, then we can figure out what's wrong with the Chinese system or maybe even learn that maybe they're doing some things right in terms of not having this financialized economy. So Professor Lozanik, share with me, what are your thoughts? What should America do? You know, we saw because of the supply chain issues and things like that, uh, prices of everything, uh, uh, you know, connected with electronics, including cars, were going up. 
so uh, so th there is a genuine desire to have uh, uh, you know at home chip making so to ensure the supply chain and all that but what can america do in your eyes to strengthen our industry and our competitiveness if china has such a great system with a horrible uh, horrible exploitative nature when it comes to human freedom and liberty what are things which america can do to strengthen its industrial capacity yeah so the government has a role to play but we got to get our systems of corporate governance correct right first so get rid of this notion of maximizing shareholder value which is just a, a theory of what I call predatory value extraction, a, a, a book that I wrote with a fellow named Jiang Shin a couple of years ago. It's a, just a loot, way in which you loot companies in the name of the of somehow efficiency, and it's not efficiency, it's destroying value, not creating value. And what you do is you employ people, you invest in their capabilities, you retain those people, you create careers, uh, and uh, you uh, build the technologies that we're capable of building. Uh, it's not that we don't have the education. It's not that we don't have the knowledge. Uh, we don't have the governance systems and we have the all totally in, uh, wrong incentives in place within companies for executives with their stock-based pay and also with the extent to which at this point, uh, it's not just the executives within the companies, is uh, hedge funds, uh, which have nothing to do with the company. You can buy up a small percentage of the share of a company and destroy a company like DuPont or GE or Procter & Gamble, which a guy named Nelson Peltz have done, or uh, people like Carl Icahn are doing this, people like Paul Singer are doing this. Those people got to be called out. And but it's not just those people, it's the activities. There's a whole realm of private equity that is going and through dividend recapitalizations. We learned about this when Mitt Romney was running for president because uh, he perfected this at Bain Capital or going into companies and just extracting value for themselves that they did not help to create. Okay, that we allow that to go on in plain sight basically. And uh, if we don't stop that, we're just gonna get more of the same. And that is uh, more income inequality, uh, more people who are down literally mobile. Uh, and the other side of that is a lack of uh, global competitiveness. Now, just one last thing on this is that if we look at those tech companies and we look at who they employ, uh, we, uh, uh, I, I've done, uh, this was really in a, in a study of what's happened to black employment in the United States and the lack, uh, why there's so few uh, African Americans uh, in the tech companies like Intel, Apple, Microsoft, et cetera, uh, where among the professional groups, the people who are the most highly trained uh, programmers, uh, scientists, et cetera, uh, blacks might be two or 3% or 12 or 13% of the population. Uh, uh, Asian Americans or Asians are uh, about 40 or 45% or about 6% of the population. That's great in terms of us ha having access to that Asian labor force, but we have to recognize that we actually are benefiting from those relationships and having a global labor supply, often supported by things like H-1B visas and L-1 visas. And again, I'm not against the globalization and movement of people around the world. I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not a protectionist, but we have to recognize that we live in a global economy where the United States actually has been be benefiting by these investments in, in knowledge, investments in, in education that the Asian companies have made, uh, countries have made over the last decades that have allowed them to grow, but they've allowed us to grow as well. And in many ways, as we've taken advantage of that as a nation, uh, we have actually ignored the population within the country uh, who did not get access to the education that they should have gotten, uh, whose education was not upgraded. So we've come become a company of uh, uh, more and more people who are downly mobile, uh, have jobs that don't pay very well, or we get excited when they now go up a dollar, you know, an hour in, in the, you know, after the pandemic and the great resignation when in fact, real wages haven't risen for decades, you know, and then we have people, you know, who are so, so rich that they, you know, a few people own, uh, have more wealth than all of Africa or whatever, you know, I mean, that, that's so the situation much. we have.
So your message is invest in human being and knowledge base and infrastructure instead of doling out money to the companies who are trying to just uh, profit and from it. Well, the money's in the companies. I have no problem with the making profits, but reinvest those profits. Thank you so much. It. Yeah, and keep people employed, pay higher wages, pay higher wages that are justified by productivity because the people are becoming more experienced and just stop allowing all this money to be extracted by companies, by people who contribute nothing. Uh, to the companies actually destroy their value creating capabilities. Thank you so much, Professor Lazanik, for your time. Truly really appreciate that. Okay, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Back to you, Hina. Thank you so much, Imam Mujahid. That's all from our Washington studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can find previous episodes and more on our YouTube or Facebook. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.